Well, ladies and gentlemen and everyone, good evening. My name is Julie McCrossan and it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome you to the Wonka Wellbeing webinar on deafness, hearing loss, many years disease and tinnitus. And it's hosted, of course, by Walper Jewish Hospital and Friends of Walper. And our partners this evening are here for you, funded by deaf people, run by deaf people for deaf teenagers, and also the Shepherd Centre, a centre providing specialised programs for children with hearing loss and also support to their families. And uh, it's uh, important for me to let you know that there are captions available for this webinar. There's two ways you can get access to the captions if you would like to use them. You can turn them on in the Zoom function. If you look at the bottom, uh, there's CC closed caption, and you can click on that and activate the captions in Zoom. If you prefer, there is also a link in the chat, and this is for people who wish to use this link in order to have more options that they can use in that functionality. So you can do it either down the bottom with CC closed caption, or you can use the link in chat. And of course, you don't have to use it at all if it's not required. And ladies and gentlemen, just before we begin some quick housekeeping, you know that we love questions and you can start posting your questions in Q&A. You can see the bottom down the bottom of Zoom. Put those questions in Zoom all the way out throughout our webinar. Dr. Peter Stein is our question moderator this evening and he'll be moderating those questions and I will come to, the, to him regularly and we'll get through as many questions as we can. Of course, you can, uh, they will all be anonymous. We can't go into detailed personal matters, but we will give you good evidence-based uh, broad information. So start putting those questions now. So ladies and gentlemen and everyone, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure now to welcome Dr. Peter Stein, medical specialist in radiology and imaging. He's our host and question moderator, as I said. Dr. Alan Schell is currently on sabbatical. So welcome to you, Peter. Just pop yourself on, uh, Peter, you're currently on mute. It's uh, my pleasure. Thank you, Julie. My pleasure to be here and uh, to play a part in this seminar on hearing loss, deafness, many is disease and tinnitus. And uh, just a reminder about the role of Walpa Hospital that sponsors the program in our community in Wallara. Walpa offers services uh, for medical, medical services for those needing short stay hospi hospitalization. It has a specialized palliative care team uh, that offers dignity and hope to patients and uh, ensures they're physically pain-free and emotional support to their families. It has a wonderful rehab ward regarded as a premier facility. And uh, it's uh, been praised widely in the community. And we're so pleased that Walter's uh, supporting the program. I'm also pleased now to invite our first uh, and first speaker, Olivia Anderson. And uh, Olivia is going to tell us uh, about her own personal journey with deafness and also to inspire us with uh, her response to that and, the, and her uh, creation of the Here For You Foundation. So with that, I'd like to welcome our partner, Olivia. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you so much. Um, yes, my name is Olivia Anderson. I was born with profound bilateral hearing loss and diagnosed at eight months old. I received some early intervention help from the Shepherd Centre and wore hearing aids before getting a cochlear implant when I was 30. I suffered from many years on and off since the age of 16 and it would improved when I was implanted by Professor Bill Gibson. Apart from kindergarten in a school with a hearing support unit, I really met other deaf kids who were in a similar situation to me. The deaf people I did meet were either way younger or way older. I didn't use sign language or see myself as culturally deaf. I was either deaf or hearing impaired, but otherwise normal. I just wanted to fit in. In 2008, 
I was awarded a Churchill Fellowship, which allowed me to travel to the United States, England, and Norway, where I undertook research on leadership programs for young people with hearing loss. I came back to Australia inspired and started my charity, Hear for You, with a wonderful team of mentors who have a hearing loss themselves and come from many different professional backgrounds. It is a mentoring program that supports teenagers at a very challenging but extremely important stage of education and life. It is an either make or break stage. Here for you can be that special place for our future teens. It is a place of support as they face the trials and tribulations of the teenage years, all of which are magnified by hearing loss. They can have the most supportive network around them, family, friends, teachers, but they need a place of their own where they can be themselves, to be able to explore their deaf identity and perhaps later on down the track to provide a foundation from which they can begin to understand the effects of hearing loss and the different ways it manifests in the social, relational, emotional and mental aspect of their life. But most importantly, all this is done in a place with other people who just get it. Our mentors are also getting those same benefits too as they reflect on and share their experiences with the teenagers. However, mentor is not always easy. It's not as if the teens become best friends for life within the first five minutes seconds of meeting each other. It can be a hard slog for both our mentors and teenagers as they go through the process of feeling comfortable and then starting to share their experiences. We want to spark self-awareness to impress on them the importance of self-advocacy to have them understand that this is their journey to take control of. We want to see them thriving instead of just surviving. It can be thankless work, but our mentors innately know the incredible value of the work they do. They are the heart and soul of you, particularly at our or volunteers. The teenagers themselves are usually the last one to understand any positive impact this mentoring may have on their lives. And even then, they may not have this realization until years later or at all. Thank you so much, Olivia. Thank you so much for that presentation. As you know, this is deaf sign clapping, uh, something I, I do in, in all the webinars that, are, that I'm involved in. And uh, just on behalf of everyone, I know for family reasons, you need to leave us. But can I recommend to our viewers this evening the Here For You website, which is absolutely brilliant. It has a comprehensive explanation of the mentoring scheme for young people you've described. And uh, I just, on behalf of everyone, want, uh, on behalf of everyone, want to say thank you so much for being a part of our event this evening. Thank you, thank, <laughs> thank you, you very much. <laughs> and uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you've just joined us, uh, my name is Julie McCrossan, and tonight we're talking about deafness, hearing loss, Meniere's disease, and tinnitus. And your questions are welcome. You'll see in the Q and A function at the bottom of your Zoom link. Uh, you can put your questions and we'll come to as many of them as we possibly can before we finish at nine o'clock this evening. Uh, and also, if you do want to use closed captions, you can see on the bottom of your Zoom, uh, you can click on CC closed captions and activate them there. Or if you want more options and more functionality, if you go into the chat area, there's a link uh, that will enable you uh, to do even more. Well, just before we meet our panel, we've got an audience poll so our panel can learn a little bit about you. So I'll ask our 
our media man from behind the scenes, Michael, to put up the first poll question. I'll read that poll question, let you answer it, and then I'll give you the answer. Your age, up to 29 years, 20 to 30 years, 31 to 40, 41 to 50, 51 to 60, or over 60. Please put your answer now. And the answer, please. And you'll see there that the majority of our uh, audience this evening, 81% uh, uh, are over 60, uh, the next largest group over 50. And then you can see we have smaller numbers in the younger years. And just a reminder that there will be an additional audience because we are recording this evening and it will be available on the Walper Hospital website. If we could have our second question, please. Hearing, do you have a hearing loss? No, mild, moderate, moderately severe, severe, profound. Please put your answer. And the answer please. 30% no, 36% mild, 18% moderate, 13% moderately severe, 3% severe and 1% profound. Thank you so much. Thank you, that's so important for our panel. Our next question, please. Do you suffer from Menier's disease? Never, once, occasionally, often. Your answer, please. And the answer, thank you, Michael. Never 70%, once 5%, occasionally 7%, and often 18%. Thank you very much. Our next question. Do you suffer from tinnitus? Never, once, occasionally, often. Your answer, please. And now we'll see your answers. 29% never have had tinnitus, 3% once, 18% occasionally, 51% often. Thank you so much for coming this evening. We're really hoping we're going to be useful to you. Our final question, please. Are you a patient of an otolaryngologist, an ear, nose and throat doctor? Yes, no, occasionally. And the answer, please. Yes, 28% of our audience this evening have attended an ear, nose and throat surgeon, an otolaryngologist, 53% no, and 19% occasionally. Look, thank you so much. That is just so helpful. It gives me great pleasure now to ask our panel members to join us on screen. Emeritus Professor William Gibson, AO, if you could join us. Professor Bamani Gopinath, uh, also could join us, and Associate Professor Melanie Ferguson. And uh, I'll do the deaf sign clapping. Do you want to clap each other and welcome each other? Uh, Olivia mentioned that she was not culturally deaf, and I just want to acknowledge before we begin our conversation that while, while we will be hearing about cochlear implants and answering your questions about them, uh, of course there are uh, members of the deaf community who see uh, it as a, a special and authentic culture, and that signing is a, a, an authentic and important language, and we acknowledge that as well. So welcome to everyone, and remember, ladies and gentlemen, your questions are welcome in the Q&A. And our aim tonight is really to give you a, a broad understanding of deafness, hearing loss, menias, and tinnitus, and we will send you uh, some uh, important websites where you can get additional information uh, along with a feedback sheet uh, after this evening's presentation. And I'll introduce each of our panel members as we come to them. If I may come to you, Bill, first, Emeritus Professor William Gibson, AO, a semi-retired oh, yeah. ear specialist, I think you call yourself, Bill, an ear, nose and throat surgeon, very experienced, a world leader in cochlear implant implementation and with a special interest in many as uh, welcome to you. Uh, let's you. begin perhaps uh, by explaining uh, what is a cochlear implant? Let's go straight to that issue because we've seen Olivia uh, using one this evening with her opening presentation. 
she's done fantastically well, hasn't she? Because she was born with her hearing loss. I mean, it's hard for people who have been born with the hearing loss to get used to uh, the cochlear implant. The cochlear implant is a device that was um, developed in various countries, but the country that really developed the first usable cochlear implant was Australia and Professor Graham Clark. It's a device that picks up sound in a processor and then changes into electrical energy, which is fed into the cochlea. And then depending on how they stimulate the cochlea, it can replicate uh, sounds. And, and, and speech is the important thing. And, and speech. And, uh, and uh, uh, I think one of your very key messages this evening is that cochlear implants are now available across the age range. Just yeah. before I ask you more about cochlear implants, in what circumstances would a person talk to an ENT specialist or, uh, about whether a cochlear implant may be useful to them? What, 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 what would lead someone to get that assessment and have that conversation? Um, I'm particularly interested because older people may be um, not so res a bit reticent to go ahead with a cochlear implant. But basically, if the hearing aid does not give you sufficient hearing, then the cochlear implant can. So if you can't hear um, your friends and your relatives properly, properly and have to hide away from them, cochlear implant will bring you back to being able to speak with them. It's the oldest implant that I know was over 100 when they received their cochlear implant. And uh, the operation is fairly simple these days. It's just a small incision behind the ear. Um, so younger people can just have it as a day stay. Older people usually stay overnight. But compared with hip or knee surgery, it's a nothing. So anybody who can't hear their family properly, can't use the telephone properly, they should strongly consider a cochlear implant. And certainly talk to someone about it. Uh, my understanding is that the quality of the sound has improved. Can you tell us what it used to be like? Because uh, uh, And then what you feel it is like now? It's hard to say what it was like because it depends on how many nerve fibers and things re remained in the ear, so how much you could stimulate. But it used to be, people used to say it was like Mickey Mouse speaking underwater, which wasn't very flattering in the early days. But really the program has been getting better and better and better. And now it's quite realistic. So we have people that are only deaf in one ear that can uh, go ahead and have a cochlear implant in their deaf ear and it'll match up with their hearing ear. So that was unthought of until about 10 years ago. And I understand uh, from our earlier conversation that you believe people can actually enjoy many sorts of music, but it's not yet at the stage where someone think... who's passionate about classical music can yeah, if really you're achieve really passionate, It's not, probably not for classical music, but certainly people can uh, listen to popular music with their implants, depending on how good the result is, of course. Yeah. And again, what we're doing, ladies and gentlemen, is I'm hearing, I'm going to introduce you to each of our panel members and give you a broad overview of our topic. And then through your questions and my additional questions, we'll dig a little deeper. But just staying with cochlear implants at the moment, an important message is to, to make sure you go to a surgeon at a major public hospital. And there's even a website that is worth knowing about in terms of getting someone who does it regularly and uh, it's reasonable around price. Can you just speak to that? Yes. Well, the, most of the major hospitals in Sydney and uh, certainly Canberra, Bris Brisbane, uh, um, all have surgeons that are capable of doing the cochlear implant. If you're a public patient, you should be able to access these without any cost to yourself. If you're a private patient, you just it's better to go to one of the surgeons that's in one of the major hospitals uh, rather than going to somebody who may be doing his first ever cochlear implant. You, it's we have a thing called NextSense, and uh, we have 12 surgeons now that work through NextSense throughout New South Wales, ACT and, and Northern Territory. And of course, they've all been approved by us as being uh, good surgeons and not greedy ones. Yes, and uh, there are uh, many of the surgeons listed on NextSense who do not charge a gap, for example. Yes, you have to ask them, but uh, in, when I was operating, I never ever charged gaps for cochlear implants. 
So it's worth asking. And of course, you said he, but of course, we have female ear, nose and throat doctors these days, don't we? Yeah, well, they're very good. In fact, the person that took over from me is Professor Kathy Berman, and she's fantastic. And uh, if I need a cochlear implant, my wife seems to think I'm close to it. I'm, I use hearing aids. Um, I will choose Cathy to do mine. Well, as you know, of course, we won't promote individuals, but look, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to hear a little bit now about Menia's disease and tinnitus as well, because we want to have clear understandings of our topics tonight. And I'm going to stay with Bill, if I may, for oh. that, because you've got a, an area of expertise in Menia's. But just in a nutshell, that what is it? And what are the sort of symptoms that mean a person may need to seek help from an ear, nose and throat doctor or some other health professional? Many as disease is a condition that causes nasty attacks of vertigo that go on for quite a long time when the whole world's spinning around. Hearing loss that can fluctuate and gradually gets worse, tinnitus and a feeling of fullness in the ear. If you have all these symptoms, then you almost certainly have many as, but obviously a more detailed uh, history has to be taken and the hearing tests and vestibular tests are important. Um, it's a horrible disease because its peak time of occurring is between about 40 and 60. And that's often when people are trying to look after their family and now the major breadwinner and suddenly they have these ghastly attacks where the whole world spins around them and they can't work and it's very distressing so it's a about a hundred thousand people in australia suffer from this nasty condition and we know we have quite a large number of our audience proportion of our audience tonight have this but my understanding is there's no cure but medications can assist uh, we don't really have a cure, but we have ways of trying to alleviate some of the symptoms. Okay, thank you. And uh, I'm going to come to that in more detail later, but let's just give a definition of tinnitus. And again, some of the causes there and what you're able to do you to assist be asking people with that. The others about this. Uh, tinnitus usually seems to begin with an uh, air condition, but the trouble, and uh, if, in fact, 95% of people over the age of um, 25, if you put them in a soundproof room, have some tinnitus because the ear is such a delicate mechanism. And what is it, Bill? What is tinnitus? And it's a sound that is being made in your head um, and there's no external sound coming in. So you hear a, a, a pulsing sound, a, a, a whooshing sound, a high pitch sound. And um, after you get to... Um, uh, well, at 55, about 30% of people have some tinnitus, according to a study we did in the Blue Mountains. Fortunately, only 5% of them find it distressing and upsetting. So that means that 1.6% uh, of people um, over 55 have distressing tinnitus. So that's uh, more than one person in 100, and it, it can rule their lives. They think it's the ear, but now the brain is, is, is contributing, contributes a lot to the loudness of tinnitus. There are mechanisms in the brain that amplify it. And just in a nutshell, what are some of the treatment or management options you, that can be offered to people to help them live with tinnitus if it can't be eliminated? We have to try to adapt the tinnitus. So if you had a really tight shoe on, gradually you should get used to the fact that the shoe's there. So with tinnitus, because there's no medications that alter it, we have to try to get them to adapt to their tinnitus. So they mustn't fear it, they mustn't be worried by it, and they may be helped by having a, a more friendly sound coming in to compete with their tinnitus. So I'm sure you should ask uh, Bermini about uh, masking, and we don't like masking, but uh, um, using a, a different sound inputs to lessen tinnitus. Look, thank you so much, Bill, for kicking us off. And if you've just joined us, uh, uh, we will be coming to questions, but I want to introduce you to the main themes and the members of our panel. If I could ask Professor Bamani Gopanath uh, to uh, turn on her microphone, but also Dr. Melanie Ferguson, and let me introduce you to both of them. And I thought we might address some of the issues uh, uh, jointly with you. So Professor Bamani Gopanath is the inaugural cochlear chair in hearing 
and Health at Macquarie University in Sydney, a researcher and, and like Melanie and indeed Bill, uh, widely published. And Associate Professor Melanie Ferguson is uh, an Associate Professor in Brain and Hearing at the Hear and Head of Ear Science Institute's Brain and Hearing Group at Curtin University in Perth. And we thank you for joining us from across the nation. An audiologist originally, and uh, again, a, a strong researcher and, and also an educator. So a big welcome to you both. If I come to you first, Barmani, just before we begin, is there any comment you'd like to make on anything that Bill has said? Uh, if I could come to you on that first. Um, no, I think Bill summarized it really well. Um, in regards to tinnitus, um, we've done some work, as Bill alluded to, in the Blue Mountains hearing study. Um, and one of the um, key areas that I'm very much interested in is lifestyle factors. So we looked at lifestyle risk factors and how they might be linked to tinnitus. And there seems to be um, dietary factors that can potentially minimize um, tinnitus. So it's quite novel stuff and it really would require further research, but we're really exploring that more and more. So one of my postdocs, Dr. Diana Tang, is very much focused on dietary factors and what the links might be to tinnitus and if there are certain dietary factors that can minimize the severity of tinnitus symptoms. Um, and another area of uh, interest for us is to see how tinnitus might impact broad range of outcomes, health outcomes. So we found it to be associated with, you know, obviously mental health, um, high likelihood of depressive symptoms, quality of life. Um, and, and it's very similar with the work that we do with hearing loss, looking at risk factors and impacts for hearing loss in older adults. Look, thank you. I'm going to come back to you about the dietary and uh, the links between diet and exercise and the capacity uh, to perhaps prevent or, or even manage more effectively hearing loss. But can I just come to you, Melanie, because as I understand it, a critical issue you want people to realise is that if they're having trouble with their hearing, get a professional assessment from an audiologist, for example, such as yourself, uh, to understand exactly what's happening because as Bamini has referred to, hearing loss can have a really significant impact on your life. Can you explain what an audiologist is and why early assessment is critical? Yeah, so, so I trained in audiology many, many years ago and have worked in, in research since. Um, so an, audiology, an audiologist is a, a healthcare professional. Sometimes they're called hearing healthcare professionals. And um, audiologists have... Um, got a sort of a range of, of skills from um, assessing people's hearing and trying to get to the bottom of what causes the hearing um, to um, helping people to be able to um, rehabilitate the hearing. So there's a number of different options um, audiologists can um, take. Hearing aids are the main, main option. Um, and have been shown to be clinically effective, highly clinically effective, but there's a range of other um, um, interventions and options that can be um, um, sort of offered or offered by audiologists. And then there's a sort of the general rehabilitation, how do people get used to um, the hearing? And this isn't just about hearing loss, audiologists are trained in tinnitus, they're also trained in vestibular and balance systems. So of course, what we're talking about tonight is part of what we're talking about tonight is many SSE, so we've got the three symptoms there. So audiologists are, 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 are clinical healthcare professionals um, that can um, help people with hearing loss, tinnitus and balance. Um, across the lifespan, from babies um, just being born uh, to um, to older people. Look, thank you. Just, I think I want to go to questions shortly, but could I just ask, Bamini, if you could say this the psycho psychosocial impact? I'd like to hear from Bamini, and then I'll I'll come to you, Melanie, as well. Just give a sense to people of the extraordinary impact hearing loss can have, even if it begins in middle age. It's critical to get onto it. What are the impacts it can have on your life? Well, um, Julie, the impacts of hearing loss are quite broad um, and they can be quite profound. So the, the loss of ability to communicate with others as a result of a hearing impairment um, can lead to social isolation, loneliness and frustration, particularly among older adults with a hearing impairment. And, um, and some of the research, again, that we did with the Blue Mountains hearing study, but also other studies have shown that this can then lead to 
th those downstream ne negative impacts such as a poorer quality of life, um, a greater risk of frailty, falls, functional disability, greater likelihood of depressive symptoms. Um, and a recent uh, report or publication that came out uh, last year found that hearing loss in midlife was the uh, single biggest modifiable risk factor uh, for dementia. Um, so it, it's quite profound uh, and it's really important uh, uh, to actually ensure that you have it detected earlier um, and that you could have the appropriate interventions um, to ensure that you minimize those negative impacts further down. I must admit, I was absolutely astounded when, when you mentioned falls prevention. That's just so amazing. We will come back to you for your preventative exercise and diet lessons a, a little bit later. Uh, Melanie, would you just like to add any comment there to the, the, the impact it can have on an individual's life? We've had an overview there, but what's the one that perhaps you've researched and you have the highest concern about in terms of unmanaged hearing loss and what it does to people's lives? Yeah, well, Barmany explained very nicely around the psychosocial aspects around hearing loss. So if you think about hearing loss, people just think it's ear, it's hearing, it's, it's an invisible disability. Um, but it, it can have a very profound effect on, on people's lives. I think the main uh, difficulty that people have is with communication with, it, with other people, being able to, as we're doing now, to be able to have a one-to-one -one conversation or group conversations. And there's quite a bit of research to go and show that if people are unable um, to hear or unable to participate in everyday life, you know, whether it's at work, school, with your family, that this can lead to um, um, issues with well-being um, and it can lead to problems with um, mental health. And, you know, we see increased um, uh, prevalence of things like anxiety and depression. Um, in people who don't have their hearing loss treated. And go back to you, one of the second question you asked me that I didn't answer, which is about um, if you notice that you have hearing difficulties and Barmany touched on this, is and if there was one message I was to, would give tonight, it is if you notice that you have difficulties with your hearing, if you notice that you're saying pardon, you're missing what people are saying, it's really, really important that you do something about it. And the best thing to do is to go and see an audiologist as soon as possible. So a fun fact is that there's been research shown that when people first notice hearing difficulties, and this could be in their 50s, I'm noticing it now, you know, I'm missing things that are being said. Research has shown that it takes an average nine years for people to, from noticing when they have hearing difficulties to um, doing something about it. And that's just going for a hearing test. It may take another few years before people um, get some additional help, for example, with hearing aids. So early detection, early intervention is one of the um, sort of important mantras. So my advice for anybody out there, don't wait. Um, we, we've done research in the past which shows that if you get your hearing tested younger, um, so maybe in your, your, your late 50s, 60s or earlier, if you've if, if your um, hearing loss is, is due to something other than age, um, you will have better outcomes. You will have better outcomes in terms of your relationships with other people, in terms of communicating with other people and your general uh, quality of life. Uh, Bill, just before Hello. you come in, I, I, I just will hold you there if I may, because I'm going to go to some questions and I've got a number of other issues to raise with everybody and I will come to you, Bill, but let's uh, welcome Dr. Peter Stein, if we could, our question moderator this evening. Uh, Dr. Alan Shell is uh, currently on sabbatical. Peter, can you join us and give us the first question, please? Just one at a time. Uh, yes, uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, people asking personal questions about their own personal conditions. And uh, the question that I want to phrase around that is uh, uh, what would uh, what one of the panelists uh, advise people to do if they noticed, for example, a new onset of a symptom? And I'd want to add my own personal question to possibly to Professor, are there any other serious conditions that could imitate um, tinnitus, which of, of this benign type that we're talking about? I'm a specialist in imaging and you probably know what I'm talking about, but it needs to be said, I think. So the question, Peter, could you just repeat the first question? The question is, uh, what should people, people, who should people go and see if they're concerned 
about tinnitus, vertigo, hearing loss, uh, many years to symptoms. Who should they go and speak to? It seems a lot of people ha haven't from their questions that they haven't gone to speak to anybody. And the- uh, I, I, I might stop you there and we'll answer that and then we'll come to our next one. Uh, Bill, can I come to you first? Because I just want to share a challenge with you and then I'll see if uh, Bamini or Melanie want to come in as well. It seems to me that there isn't a clear source of advice at the moment about where to go and who to see. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of how you find an audiologist, they're often associated with hearing aid commercial interests and uh, the source of independent assessment and advice. What my instinct is you'd go to your general practitioner and no, seek their advice. Right. What would you say, Bill? I think you go to your general practitioner first. Um, for instance, people with tinnitus are terrified they might have a, a brain tumour. It's extremely rare. I, I've only seen maybe one or two cases. But an MRI nowadays can be so reassuring to people that have tinnitus so that they know, no, I don't have anything ghastly there. Mm -hmm. So I do think that it's worthwhile if people are having distressing tinnitus, can't sleep or upset, can't work because they're tinnitus, an MRI is important. They can get that now through their family doctor or they can come to their friendly ENT surgeon, whichever. And can I ask you, what are some of the other causes of tinnitus? So we haven't actually oh. run through the causes oh well maybe ask the audiologist but i i guess noise exposure is the worst thing if people have had a very noisy job or have worked in a pop band or something like that then quite a high proportion get tinnitus not all of them find it distressing fortunately then there's a number of ear conditions many as is a is a common cause of tinnitus but there's other ear conditions like otosclerosis where the bones are not working properly um, and uh, well I should put it over to um, Melanie but uh, I think that noise exposure is probably the an old age as you get older. And, and if I could add I, I'm a cancer survivor and my chemotherapy the uh, the chemo, chemo that I was given uh, also is associated with tinnitus and a very high level of people who have had um, this particular chemo yeah. get tinnitus. Chemo I can cause it there's lots of drugs in China um, lots of people who are given gentamicin uh, as primary treatment and it causes deafness and tinnitus amongst, amongst them. There's more people in China that are deafened by gentamicin than in, that live in Australia. 20 million people, according to the World Health Authority, have a hearing loss caused by ototoxic or dangerous drugs. Radiation can also cause tinnitus if, if, the, if the ear is in the field and it gets irradiated. Um, so there's many causes. I, I was going to put it over to Melanie. I probably missed. Don't worry, that. Bill. If I ask you a question, it's because we want to hear from you, and you can trust me that I will go to the other people as well. But I'm actually going to come to Bamini because my understanding is Bamini, you're can, working possibly with Melanie and others to develop a website, or you're seeking funding to develop a website that where people can go to get information about where to go if they're concerned about hearing loss. Could you speak to that? Yeah, thanks, Julie. So currently, um, there is no one stop shop or central reference point for consumers with hearing loss to access uh, unbiased, trustworthy, evidence based, credible information materials and education around, for example, the hearing loss, um, risk factors for hearing loss or interventions that they could access to support themselves or to better manage their hearing impairment. So we are actually trying to put together a grant application. Some Melanie's and um, I'm invited to be a, a chief investigator on, on my grant application um, and several other um, uh, researchers and clinicians and consumers, because it's important to have the consumer voice as we co-design this um, website. Um, so we're hoping we can address this gap uh, because um, it's really critical that people have access to sort of information and support. And we're also hoping that it's not just educational materials, but we'll have other resources that are tailored to their unique needs. So uh, potentially having webinars and Q&A sessions like very much like this one up on this website. Um, yeah. But look, thank you, and I'll come to Melanie if I may, because as someone who went to see uh, help my my late mother get hearing aids, 
uh, it, it is quite challenging because they're all different prices. Some of them are up to $9,000 or even more. And it's very hard as an, uh, just an average person to know do, what level of hearing aid I need. Any observations there as an audiologist to, to guide someone who's thinking, yes, I might need hearing aids, but how do I know which ones to get? Yeah, I mean, Harmony's hit the nail on the head. Um, I too am, um, am working on something similar but different to be able to um, sort of help people make decisions as what to do. I mean, I think we, we talked about unbiased um, opinions earlier and the way the Australian hearing health care um, uh, system is set up. It's, it's quite different from the UK where you have the NHS, which is quite separate from um, uh, busy, you know, hearing aid manufacturers and businesses. Um, but I think, um, I think it is really important to have some trust with um, audiologists and, you know, you've got audiologists working for different companies and um, there isn't a sort of, there isn't a sort of go-to website to go and say, this is what you need. This is what Barmany and I are working on because we know it's really important. And in fact, there was a report that came out um, last September um, for the hearing services program. This was really, really clear. It was a really clear need to have good quality information to, to guide people. In the absence of that, until Barmany get, and I get on with, with our work, I think we need to trust audiologists. And, you know, you can, you can walk up the street. One of the great things about Australia is you, you, you don't have to go to your GP to get into the NHS like, like you do in the UK. You can see an audiologist, um, uh, an audiology clinic. You can walk up the street and you can ask for your hearing, to have your hearing tested. It's very varied as to what can be, be offered. Most people will have a screen, um, some kind of sort of low level, um, give you a low level measure of what your hearing's like. Um, some of the larger companies are offering free hearing, um, free hearing tests. Um, sometimes you have to pay for it. So it, it depends. But, you know, the best thing that I would recommend for people um, right now, I mean, you, of course, you can go online and see what there is, but it's very confusing, is to go to an audiologist, um, have your hearing tested. Um, you know, there's a whole range of different tests that they can do and speak to them to, um, to get um, the advice. You're right, there's tons of different types of hearing aids and there's all sorts of um, issues around what you have to go and pay for. But right now, you're best to go to a trusted um, audiologist, perhaps um, somebody that your friend has recommended to you. Look, thank you so much. And I will be coming back uh, to Melanie uh, to hear about some of the new technologies and that are available to help us with hearing and also some of the stigma that sometimes stops people getting hearing aids, even when they would be useful. But let's come to Dr. Peter Stein and have another of our audience questions. Welcome back, Peter. Here I am, Julie. Yes, there's been quite a number of questions uh, um, in regard to uh, dementia and deafness and in particular uh, and one question is is there a role for cochlear implants for example in people with dementia and there's also a general question of uh, the, the effect of uh, hearing loss and possibly many disease on mental health. I might just do one at a time if I can. Um, it's, it's probably my aging brain, Peter. I can only remember one at a time. So we, we do dementia. You help me to remember mental health. If I may come to Barmany, because you did mention the association uh, with dementia. So what's the state of the evidence? And then I, I, I'll get your thoughts and I might also come to, to Bill on if we have a relative or someone we love with dementia, uh, whether hearing aids may be your hearing assistance may be useful, but what's the association? What do we know about it as a, a possible causal factor of dementia? Um, so the, the link between uh, hearing loss and dementia and cognitive impairment, um, it's quite strong. Um, and it's to do with, this, well, there's several pathways um, that have been posited as to how hearing loss might cause uh, dementia and cognitive decline. Um, and one of them is there's a deprivation, sensory deprivation um, in the brain, and therefore um, there's a reduction in the cognitive functioning. But um, the, the, the evidence is strong. The, the pathways are not 100% clear. Um, however, the evidence around the, 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 whether interventions might 
prevent the decline in cognitive functioning is not that clear. Um, so there's definitely more research that needs to be done, but we do know that you know earlier detection um, and getting uh, that support, getting the uh, hearing loss managed or treated earlier on can potentially prevent that decline in cognitive function. But um, maybe Bill and Melanie might be able to expand on that. Yes, can I come to you, Melanie, first? Uh, I, I'm interested, I know you're not working directly as an audiologist now, you're more in education and research, but um, how amenable uh, are people with dementia, which obviously can be all levels of severity, uh, to something like the wearing of hearing aids? And then we might ask Bill in relation to cochlear implants. Yeah, so, um, you know, if somebody's got a hearing loss, you want to be able to manage it. You want people to be able to hear for all the reasons that we've been talking about earlier. And I mean, I think there was a sort of school of thought um, up until maybe five, six years ago that if somebody's got dementia, there's not much you can do about it in terms of their hearing loss. And that's not the case. Um, you know, there's, you know, there's a range of, um, uh, of people with dementia, um, but a good experienced audiologists should be able to and can and do work with people who have dementia across the range to try and assess their hearing and to give some kind of um, um, intervention and some um, some management options for them. It may be hearing aids, um, it may be um, headphones, um, which you know you can um, sort of have these pocket talkers, so quite low level tech, but you can still get uh, the stimulation um, to the person so that so that they can hear. So I think it's really important not to dismiss um, the fact that because somebody might be in the later stages of dementia that there's nothing you can do. And I've heard some fantastic audiologists talk about a whole range of different ways that you um, that they can work with um, patients. So I think that's a really important take home. And you know we we're, we're going to be talking about this probably for the next half an hour. Early detection, early intervention. The sooner you get people with hearing aids or other devices, um, the sooner they get used to it and it becomes more part of their everyday life. And can I ask you, there are also devices that you can put on the table that enable uh, uh, the person who has hearing loss to join a group conversation. Could you just tell us about that? Yeah, there's a whole range of devices that have been around for years and are actually getting better um, with sort of Bluetooth streaming and what have you. Um, so these are called assistive listening devices. And these are to help people to listen. So there's a whole range of them. So for example, um, there are streamers that you can connect to your television. So the uh, sound from the television can go directly to your hearing aids or directly to headphones. So you don't have to have the TV turned up really loud, which you know could be a major issue um, in, in households or for neighbors. If you've got neighbors next door and they can hear the TV blaring through. Um, there can be devices that you can uh, pin onto your uh, jacket or have around your neck. So if you're the partner of somebody with hearing loss, they can talk in the microphone and that too will get streamed directly to their, um, their hearing aids. So blocking out background noise. And there are devices that, like you mentioned, which we talked about yesterday, where you can put on in the middle of the table. So if you're having a group conversation, the microphone can pick up other, um, everybody talking. And again, this gets streamed directly. Uh, to people's hearing aids. So it's a whole, we talk about hearing aids, they are, that is the main uh, management for, for hearing loss, but we need to think about all the other options. And the kind of thing, kind of work that Barmany and I are uh, wanting to do if we get the grants is to sort of explain to people what the options are and the pros and cons for each of these options so people can make an informed choice. Look, thank you very much. And I'll just let you, uh, our audience know, I know we have a number of questions about Menier's disease and we will come to that shortly. I just want to come to Bill, if I may, and uh, with this question of the uh, uh, pertinence of cochlear implants to someone who may have had a diagnosis of dementia. Your thoughts there? I was just going to give a, a simple exp example. I had a patient come in with, who was 92 with his son and his son said, when people come to the house, dad goes off to his room and he won't come out because he can't communicate. And this is causing him distress and not helping with his mental state. He had a cochlear implant, which was good, paid by, for by the Veteran Affairs Department. 
And then the son came to see me a bit later. He said, oh, when people come to the house, dad comes out of his room. He talks to them, gives the same story over and over to them. We've heard it so many times. And he's just a new man. He's even been able to use the telephone and phone his brother in England. His life changed. So if you if you know somebody, a relative or a friend or somebody that's in that situation, they need either very good hearing aids or, if necessary, a cochlear implant. And is, is that story, does that answer the question Peter's also given us from the audience about the link between hearing loss and mental health? Is That's it, what I think it does. Yes, I think it is. Predominantly it's, social it's, isolation. can't go out to dinner. They, they sit back from the table. They won't join in the conversation. It's, it's very restricting and isolating. It's not good for your mental health. No, can, Peter Stein, if I could welcome you back. And I understand we have a number of questions coming through on many years. Could you share maybe a couple of them and then we'll do some more? Yes, thanks, Julie. There's a lot of very good and simple practical questions. People really want to know which, which things uh, don't work, things that work a little bit, and they want to know uh, a little bit about, possibly about surgical treatments and one question about uh, possible overseas treatments that we're not getting here. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Bill, can I come to you first and then I'll see if Bamini or Melanie that's, would that's like to massive add. That's a question. Um, so uh, there's a lot of things have been tried for many years. One of the things that I'm quite sure of is that salt loading, because I did a study in uh, London on this, can cause attacks. So we often tell people to go on a low salt diet. Haven't got the evidence whether that works, but we know salt loading definitely causes attacks. So there are dietary uh, factors involved. There are a number of medications. Some of the medications just dampen down your balance, like Stematil, Stugeron, etc. Um, so they just lessen the balance. So if you're an aeroplane and one wing goes too fast, they cancel both. We don't like too much Stematil and things. It can cause side effects. Uh, there's a medication called beta histine or CERC. Uh, which is a vasodilator. And I think the evidence for that really has become very slim. We'd, I don't know if I approve of that. Could I just in, ask you to explain what vasodilator means? Vaso, it causes the blood vessels in the ear to dilate and helps to change things over within the cochlea in the thought that it gets rid of some of the excess fluid in the ear and also does work on some of the brainstem nuclei as well. So that was be CERC or beta histine. I'm not a fan of it. I don't think the evidence is strong enough that it does anything. Um, steroids is the latest thing that's really come in. And there's a lot of good studies on the use of steroids in people that are having a cluster of many airs attacks. So you can either give the steroid directly into the ear by a, a long injection down the ear, frightens people, but it's not that bad, or you can give it orally. The oral ones work just as well, but there can be side effects to steroids if you take them orally. So there's a number of medications. One of the latest one is called Cisinate, which I quite like actually, um, coming out. There's no evidence that any particular vitamins or anything like that, people did try bioflavonoids and things. There's no evidence that they work. Um, so the next thing after, uh, perhaps steroids is the most popular thing when, when it's happening. And there's a thing called Zofran or Odansetron, which is a little tablet you put under the tongue. It stops you being sick. It's like magic. So eight milligrams of Odansetron can stop them vomiting. So if they're in the middle of coals and they have an attack, instead of vomiting all over the floor, you can pop a little tablet into their mouth, stop the nausea and the vomiting. And that's important because... I've had people with many years are frightened to leave their house because they think they're going to have an attack. Um, so that's that's important. Surgery is going out of fashion a little bit. We used to destroy the ear. First of all, take the whole ear out, the hearing and all. And then we just took the labyrinth out. Um, so that was a bit bit much. We can do it more gently with um, medications like gentamicin injected to the ear. But the latest fad, the latest thing is to do the labyrinthectomy, 
and take the labyrinth way, but to put a cochlear implant at the same operation. And there's a number of these have now been done. And there's been some fantastic results because the ear that wasn't hearing very well then hears much better and it also gets rid of the attacks. So uh, does everybody know Anne Elias, for instance? Um, maybe not. Uh, Can you she, explain who that is? Yeah, she runs the Dizzy Group in Sydney and she's going through this, this uh, exercise herself. And I know she doesn't mind mentioning it. And may I ask you what the Dizzy Group is? What? What is the Dizzy Group? Oh, the Dizzy is just a self-help group that a um, number of people that suffer from many years so they can talk to each other, say how they manage to cook with, without putting too much salt in their food, how they manage to keep the fluid down in their body, especially around periods and things like that, menstrual periods, which can uh, exacerbate the attacks. So they, they, they're very good. There's, there might be about 60 people now in the group in Sydney, and there's similar groups um, outside. And they come to me sometimes and give me great ideas about what we can do to help people with many years. We don't have a cure, you see. We can only alleviate the symptoms. Look, thank you so much. And if you've just joined us and you do want to use captions on the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, it's not there currently, but I'll ask Erin, who's in caption land, uh, uh, to recheck that it's on the Zoom screen. But you can go into chat and there's a link there that you can click and activate captions. Just before we leave many years, I, I wonder if I could come to you, Melanie, and then I'll come to you, Barmany, for any comments around assisting people who experience manias or anything to do with manias. Do you want to go first, Melanie, please? Yeah, so manias isn't really my area of expertise, but um, when, I was, when I was listening to uh, Bill talking, um, I did sort of think about, even cast my mind back decades ago when I was seeing patients in clinic, um, is that, you know, vertigo is a, a balance disorders is a, is a problem with manias. And if we just sort of look at the sort of the vertigo side of things, Bill's been talking about lots of sort of medications that you can take. And I, I remember all those medications, um, you know, being, being suggested, um, you know, when I was um, um, seeing uh, patients. But what's come through over the, I would say over the last sort of 10, 15 years is that and when people have, have, have got dizziness, and I'm not specifically talking just about many years, but people have got balance problems, is that they really frightened to move. You know, they sort of think, if, you know, if I move my head backwards, it makes me dizzy. If I stand up quickly, it makes me dizzy. So the advice really now is to um, keep moving as, um, as much as you can. So don't stay still because that, will, will, uh, that won't help. What you need to do is to exercise your um, vestibular systems, your balance organs, um, you've got two in your ears. Um, and there's a whole range of different type of exercises that um, audiologists um, offer now, or sometimes you see physiotherapists um, offering exercises, which really sort of help strengthen the uh, balance system. So it's like sort of physiotherapy uh, for the balance organ organs. So I just thought that was an, another sort of um, sort of management option that people who have dizziness have. And those, those um, exercises have been shown to be um, successful in many people. A quick comment from you, Bill. I, I saw a certain nodding occurring, but just a, you need to turn your mic on. Uh, turn on your mic. Got muted by the technical guy. Um, uh, physiotherapy is very helpful for people because once they've had many as they lose a lot of their balance and they haven't really got enough to cope, especially if they can't use their eyes to balance. And physios can be very, very useful indeed. Um, the hearing aids are difficult to fit to many as patients because the hearing keeps going up and down and up and down. So they have to have an adjustable hearing aid. Uh, Celine McNeil, who did her PhD with me on many as disease, um, because of the trying to get programmable hearing aids, uh, which would suit people with many ears. So if you have many ears disease, uh, you do need to have a, a fairly expert audiologist fit it. It's no good just going to your local shop and seeing um, somebody who has a fleeting mem knowledge of hearing aids. You need to see an audiologist. Thank you, Melanie. Just a quick comment there, because there are smartphone connected hearing aids now. Just a word from you on that, please. Yeah, so we're seeing more and more of these. They've been around for a few years now, but they're not necessarily in widespread um, use. So 
Um, it used to be that you had your hearing aid programmed by the audiologists and whatever the settings were, pretty much you went home with them. There were maybe a couple of programs you could um, use or a little bit of volume. Um, but there are um, smartphone connected hearing aids or user controlled hearing aids, which Bill would fit perfectly or would certainly help somebody with fluctuating hearing loss um, as a result of, yes, right, yeah, as a result of uh, many years. So Bill's obviously got user controlled hearing aids. I think that's Jane Resound looking at the, oh, bit of advertising there, uh, looking at the pink. So we've done some studies um, um, a couple of years ago of um, looking to see what the benefits of um, user controlled or smartphone controlled um, hearing aids are. And my advice is to people, if you if you can, if you use a smartphone and you, you go to get a hearing aid, ensure that you get the type of hearing aid that connect to your a smartphone because the user controllability is, is really, really makes a big difference because you can set the sound to what you like. So we know that one of the big problems that people had with hearing aids years ago, but still now, is, is a lot of a lot of background noise gets amplified as well. So you can turn down the background noise. I, re I remember tr trying this myself a few a few years ago before we started the study, and it was fantastic. You can change the sound. You can set the sound to what you want. And the research that we've done, which we've we've published, we've got another paper coming out soon, has shown a whole range of benefits. People um, uh, feel empowered. They feel like they can control. Their, their, their hearing, their hearing aid, and the situations they're in. They're able to participate better because they can hear better, so they can communicate with others. They're less fatigued at the end of the day because they feel more in control of what they're doing. And a really interesting finding, which we weren't necessarily expecting, was that people reported that they felt there was less stigma in having a smartphone or user-controlled hearing aids uh, because they were modern. And, you know, in our study, when we, we were running focus groups, people were saying, you know, I was showing, I was showing this to my, my children, you know, adult children in their 20s. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's really cool. You know, you've got this smartphone connecting your hearing aids. You know, gone are the days of the old bit of plastic that stuck in your ear that whistled and was embarrassing. Uh, hearing aids are so much more um, sophisticated. So my other message would be, if you need hearing aids, um, ensure that and you're a smartphone user, which many people are, irrespective of age. You know, in our study, we had people over the age of 80 taking part, had really good um, res results. Um, ask for um, um, a hearing aid which you can control with your smartphone, and you are likely to have much, much better results. And if you've got good outcomes, you'll continue using your hearing aids, and all the other downstream effects we've been hearing about are less likely to happen. Thank you so much. Uh, that's so interesting. Bamini, can I come to you? I want to ask you about what we can do with diet and exercise in terms of prevention. But just before I come to that, any comments on menias? Because it is obviously something of great interest to people this evening. Um, unfortunately, it's not my area of expertise. So I think Melanie and Bill really covered it well. So I'm not going to go into that if that's okay yeah. no worries not at all thank you look can you we for those who may have not heard us earlier just remind us about the connection between lifestyle and hearing loss and if you would what your research is indicating are things we can do uh, in our younger years middle age years and, and so on to try and reduce the likelihood of hearing loss um so i i really do believe a healthier life equates to healthier hearing um, and the, the research that we've done um, in the population-based um, groups, um, we've found, for example, that uh, greater intake of omega-3 fatty acids, having two or more serves of fish per week compared to having less than one serve of fish per week was associated with greater re uh, or reduced odds of having a hearing impairment over a five-year period. Um, and so the links between fish, omega-3 fatty acids and hearing loss is possibly because um, omega-3 fats can actually, uh, uh, well, we, we know from other research that omega-3 fats and fish intake um, can protect against cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular disease, a potential link um, with hearing loss um, because it can reduce uh, optimal blood flow to the cochlea and lead to a decline in hearing function. So that's one of the ways that um, omega-3 fats and fish could actually, you know, confer a protective effect on hearing function. 
We've also found certain antioxidants, um, vitamin A, C, and E, greater intake of certain antioxidants can also minimize uh, risk of developing hearing loss over a five to 10 year period. What are the sort of foods that contain antioxidants? So a, a lot of the vegetables, so having enough vegetables, uh, having a five serves of veg, um, three serves of fruits, really ensuring that you have that rainbow. Um, particularly dark green leafy vegetables are rich in antioxidants um, and the good stuff. And um, also ensuring um, you have enough fiber in your diet. So we also found a link between cereal fiber intake and a reduced odds of hearing loss. Um, and the other sort of main uh, lifestyle factors is physical activity. Um, physical activity is good for everything and it, it appears to help prevent everything, but just going straight to hearing, why is exercise good for your ears? Um, so again, it's probably the vascular pathway. So um, ensuring that you have um, optimal flow to the cochlea in a year. Um, these are ways like physical activity is definitely associated with reduced risk of cardiovascular disease again. Um, but our research, we like there are other studies that have shown that having enough physical activity in your day can be associated with um, reduced likelihood of hearing loss. Um, so the, the research that we did, we weren't able to show that, but there are other studies that have shown this. Um, and also smoking. Smoking is a risk factor for hearing loss as well. Okay, thank you for mentioning that. Look, I want to get Peter Stein back because wax, 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 wax has to crack a mention. What's the, what do we need to talk about, Peter? Oh, well, uh, the question I think is that, well, we've got a cluster of symptoms for Targo, hearing, hearing loss, tinnitus. Uh, would, and maybe uh, Professor, uh, uh, would wax, wax have uh, exacerbate and make those symptoms worse? Uh, there's also a question about uh, COVID, either COVID itself or COVID vaccination, making any of those symptoms for Tiger, many years, tinnitus or hearing loss worse. Thank you so or, much. Now, I just have to tell you, Bill, before you answer this question, I have an appointment tomorrow with an ear, nose and throat man who's going to get the wax out of my ears. And you probably notice I'm talking a little bit loud tonight. I'm a bit deaf. You need to turn that mic on, my darling. If I may call you darling, I beg your pardon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, that's very nice. Thank you. Um, if you block the ear, if you've got tinnitus and you block the ear, you'll make the tinnitus worse. So taking out, if you, lots of people have a bit of tinnitus and don't know it's even there, if they get wax and they'll notice there's tinnitus present. If they get TMJ joint where they're blocking their ear canal a bit there, that anything that blocks the ear can make tinnitus worse. Wax is an interesting substance because it's a kind of Vaseline to keep your eardrum nice and supple and you make it and then it's meant to um, work, its, work its way down your ear canal. And one of the properties of wax is it's a natural insect repellent. I think that's very useful so you don't get the insects crawling down your ear canal. Very, very good. What was the second question? Sorry, I was getting a bit off the Any point. Any connection between COVID or COVID vaccination? Yes, yes, there's the about 10 papers discussed. now showing um, that if the virus gets into the inner ear, you can get a sudden hearing loss. And uh, I've got personally several patients who have had their many as in, re in remission and have a COVID injection or COVID and the antibody buildup has actually caused uh, their symptoms to come back and they get a cluster of attacks. So there's lots of papers now coming out. They've only just started coming out, um, showing a link between COVID and sudden hearing loss. And um, in my own interest in uh, exacerbating many years disease. So it does, yes. So what's the message to someone who, uh, who um, has got COVID or has been diagnosed with COVID and who has some concerns about hearing loss? Where do they go for assessment? Probably on the only thing that can help is steroids because you need something that's anti-inflammatory and anti these, these antibodies that have built up inside your ear. So they need to see their family doctor or whatever, and they need to go on the same regime of steroids as you would give somebody who has a Bell's palsy. So Peter would know that. 
and the GP can give it. And that if that's done very quickly, that's got a better chance of success. If you wait six weeks, like somebody did today that saw me giving the steroids, I don't think I can do much good giving steroids six weeks later. It's got to be done straight away. And could I just get clarification on the question of, is there a link between these conditions and the vaccine? What's, what are we saying yes, about the vaccine? There is. There is a link between sudden deafness and vaccine. Very small number of people, fortunately. Um, far more people die because they don't have the vaccine than get a sudden hearing loss because they have had the vaccine. But there are papers. Um, I sh I can, if anybody's interested, I can look them up and send them out to to people um, I, but I, I'm I, quite shocked because I've been telling people oh no it doesn't if you have the vaccine it's not going to cause you any harm and then I came across a raft of papers that show yes there is a link and Bill because uh, obviously we're in the middle of an international pandemic I myself have just had my fourth shot uh, because I'm 67 okay, I, yes. it's a sensitive public health issue uh, uh, is our recommendation it's better to have it and Yes. Reduce the risk of COVID. Is that our core message? Definitely, definitely. The chance of sudden hearing loss is, is tiny compared with all the other symptoms and horrible things that happen with COVID. Yeah. Okay, You'd be wise you. to get your fourth fourth one now? Yes, I've had my fourth one. If we, I think oh, we're over good, 65 and some other groups. I've I'm, had my fourth one and my flu shot. Just keep I've got needling to have me, mine, baby. but I don't like needles, so I'm uh, I'd like to bring Peter Stein back in because I think we've got a question related to needles. Do we have an acupuncture question, Peter? Well, yes, uh, that was as, as simple as that. Is there a place for acupuncture in the treatment of many years of tinnitus? Very clear. Thank you for that question. Uh, 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 Bill, can you give us an answer? You need no. to turn it um, on. Uh, acupuncture can relax people. Yeah, it's quite good, if, especially if you respond to acupuncture. And in place, things like Meniere's disease and things like that, certainly if you, if you can be relaxed a bit, it's beneficial. So there is a benefit. I was wondering if tinnitus was helped by acupuncture. Really, there's no evidence that uh, tinnitus can be helped by acupuncture. Maybe Bamini knows more than I about that. Um, Eleni or Bamini, would you like to comment on acupuncture only if you wish to? I, I haven't come across any research on looking at whether acupuncture actually helps people um, suffering from tinnitus symptoms. So, Mel? No, I, I mean, I, I think I remember years ago, I used to work for a very eminent um, audiological physician who was a world expert in tinnitus. And I'm pretty sure he did actually look at um, acupuncture along with, um, is it ginkgo, biloba? I can't remember it. There's all sorts of odd things. And my recollection is, you know, you wouldn't use that as a primary, you wouldn't use that as a treatment for tinnitus. Could I just ask this quick question? And then Peter, we'll have, we'll have time for one more question. Uh, uh, but I just want to ask Bill this. Um, you mentioned that acupuncture may be useful because it helps to relax people. So my obvious question is, are other strategies to achieve relaxation helpful with many as or tinnitus? Yes, and and tinnitus. Why? yes, yes. If you can relax... Um, uh, it definitely helps. People that get stressed and upset are more likely to get an attack of many years. That's, that's well known. Um, and people who have tinnitus, if they get stressed and upset, tinnitus can go through the roof. So anything that helps you to relax and uh, be cool about it is helpful. And if acupuncture can, can help in that aspect, a lot of people find acupuncture is very relaxing. Look, thank you. Peter, is there one more question we can have uh, for this evening? Yes, Julie, there's uh, still a lot of questions coming in uh, about personal symptoms. That's very important uh, because it's a personal thing, hearing loss and dizziness and many years. So I just want to uh, maybe perhaps uh, uh, there are people who've come on who didn't hear our early question. So I think it's reasonable to ask it. Uh, who is the best person if you have symptoms and you're troubled about them who is who should a patient or a listener who would we advise them to speak to about those symptoms i always think you have to go to your own family doctor first i insist on that um personally being an ent surgeon i would um go for 
dizziness and, th and things like that, or, or if they fear a tumor to an ENT surgeon. If it's an audiological problem and they can't hear properly, they can go to an audiologist first, but I would suggest an audiologist rather than just a, the local shop where there's an audiometrist that's done basic training and will only be there to sell you a hearing aid. I think you need to see, see the audiologist. Uh, can I just say, and I, I might come to a, for a comment from Melanie, but I, as um, some of our audience know, I've had a, 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 a oropharyngeal cancer, cancer of the tonsils, tongue and throat, and I have had a lot to do with ear, nose and throat surgeons. I've had radiation, I've had chemo, and I've had tinnitus as, as a result. And uh, I do think if you're seeing your GP and you have a persistent issue and you are concerned, and it is something to do with the head, I had a a very severe and persistent earache that just wouldn't go away and a, a sore throat. And I wasn't referred to an ear, nose and throat doctor and ultimately getting to one saved my life. So I guess uh, I, I, my, my message, if I may be so bold as to offer one is that you, if you do have persistent symptoms, do ask your GP to send you either to an ear, nose and throat surgeon or to an audiologist and get that second opinion from someone with special knowledge of this part of the the body but Melanie what's the key symptoms that would take you to an audiologist whether you go to your public hospital your GP advises someone what are the key symptoms well if it's, if it's to do with hearing um, I think I mentioned this right at the very beginning it's um, you, people it's the onset of hearing loss is often gradual and is quite insidious so people don't notice that it's happening um, you know, you might notice that you don't hear so well, but what we've we've seen in, in some of our research is people don't think it's them. They might think it's other people who are mumbling. Um, they People deny they've got a, a hearing loss or uh, they might not even know where to go, which is, I guess, where you're coming from. You know, what do you do if you notice difficulties? So I think if you're missing what people are saying, you're finding yourself saying, pardon, what, um, particularly in noise situations, um, you know, you need to do something about it because your hearing is, it's highly likely your hearing is not going to get better. If it's only going to get worse. Um, so, yeah, just noticing that you're having hearing difficulties, don't ignore it. Um, go and see an audiologist. I mean, you were talking about um, some of your symptoms around tinnitus and there was a whole bunch of um, red flag um, symptoms that if you went to an audiologist, audiologist would, would think, oh, actually, you know, I'm an audiologist, I deal with hearing, but actually if you've got unilateral hearing loss or what, what, uh, unilateral hearing loss or unilateral tinnitus or other symptoms, that would be a red flag for the audiologist to say, go to your GP, he will then refer you on to uh, an ENT or some other medical um, um, expert. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bamini, is there a final comment you would like to make, a, a key message that you want our audience to remember? Um, I think I just want to reiterate what the panel and particularly Mel has said. Uh, the I can't emphasize enough early detection, early intervention, um, really minimizing that progression of hearing loss um, is hugely valuable. Um, and to ensure that you can have a, a better quality of life, maintain your independence um, and maintain optimal well-being. Uh, I think that's really the key message, but also protect your hearing. Um, we know noise exposure is a huge risk factor, um, and there are so many um, ways now. I mean, obviously, I mean, I, I a lot of uh, a lot of the next generation, they you know, we're wearing AirPods, and so we're always exposed to high levels of noise. Um, but I think we need to be mindful of that. Um, and try to minimize that. So protect your hearing. Um, if you do hear, if you do feel like there is some issues with the hearing, go straight away to a GP, audiologist, and get it checked out. And could I just say, as someone who did have um, hearing issues predicted and tinnitus associated with cancer treatment, I was sent to a public hospital for an audiologist to do what they called a baseline early after my treatment. And so I have got uh, um, a record of where my hearing was a year after treatment, and they are going to predict 
uh, and uh, guide me to know, well, do another test, another test, and then they'll tell me when my hearing aids are required. So that notion of baseline data, can you help me, Melanie? That's important for people if they're developing hearing, lo hearing loss for whatever reason. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you get your first hearing test, you know, I guess that is the baseline. And depending on um, what the hearing test results are and depending on how, what people are reporting, the audiologist will advise them as to um, what to do next, what kind of um, intervention or management um, is required. In your case, I think it was probably slightly different because they were monitoring the um, effects of the probably the drugs that you were taking. So, you know, that's why you have your baseline and you, you would monitor, monitor um, you're hearing um, for that reason but but you know but monitor if, if somebody doesn't get a hearing aid or help with the hearing um, because maybe their hearing isn't seen to be um, severe enough it is really important to go and keep a tab on it and um, to watch out for any further deterioration and in fact I was involved in the NICE guideline uh, development in the UK which um, was a it resulted in some very influential guidelines and we recommended um, monitoring of hearing um, every, I can't remember the details now, but every couple of years, uh, particularly for at-risk at groups. So just because you've had one hearing test and these fine doesn't mean to say that that's it, you, you never need a hearing test. You know, just keep, keep an eye out for um, difficulties that you're having. It's all about the hearing difficulties and, your, and how you feel about it. Look, I'm going to come to Peter Stein to close our, our, our webinar shortly, but I just want to say to Bill, you were open enough, Bill, first of all, to show us your, uh, your um, smartphone connected. I, can you just show it up? Because I just want to get a photo of that. Your, if you could hold up your smartphone connected uh, hearing aid. I just want to see your smartphone. Can oh. you hold it up? And I'll take a can shot. Can you see it? Yes, that's good. Get, that's good. And I, I can choose... Uh, if I have a noise filter, speech filter, or and I can change the volume, and it can change the volume separately in the two years. I have a hereditary hearing loss because I have a U-shaped hearing loss, and as I've got older, the high frequencies have gone down as well. I run a clinic with two audiologists, Healthy Hearing, right next to um, Wolper Hospital, and uh, when the audiologists usually see them and if they think it's necessary they say can you have a quick look in this ear for me and we work together so it's, it can be quite constructive to work together with an audiologist. Now at the very beginning this will be my last question to you Bill you mentioned that it is possible to have cochlear implants later in life and you seem to feel mm. when um, hearing aids do not give you sufficient sound it can it's really worth being considered and you mentioned your wife it says you might need a cochlear implant. Oh, no, no, I'm no. not sure if you were joking. I'm aware. Of it. No, I'm, well, I'm, I've got a severe hearing loss. That's true. I see. Uh, but if it gets much worse, then it, it would have to. My father became very deaf. He, he stayed with his NHS hearing aids, um, he, but uh, he didn't have the option in those days of having a cochlear implant. So I guess my, my final serious question is, how serious would your loss of hearing have to be before you personally would consider a cochlea. Oh, if I if I if I if using the hearing aids I can't hear on the telephone, that that's my key factor. If I can't have a telephone conversation, I'd be very distressed, and then I would think about a cochlear implant. Okay. Look, thank you for that honesty. I just thought this is a real life example, so why not ask? Well, look, I I've enjoyed talking to you immensely. We will be sending out some uh, uh, web links. Uh, in relation to some of our matters, but I'd like to invite Dr. Peter Stein to formally uh, thank our panel and to close our proceedings. So thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Julia. And uh, I'm so pleased to have the honor to thank uh, our, our, our panelists, uh, Olivia, Olivia Anderson, uh, Professor William Gibson, uh, Dr. Melody Ferguson, and uh, Professor uh, Barmany Gopanath. Um, in particular, to, to thank them for sharing their, their understanding of science and medicine that goes with these problems of hearing loss, deafness, many years, disease and tinnitus, and a special thanks for our attendees for deepening our personal understanding of what that really means in day-to-day -day life in a range of ages, as we had uh, Olivia mention to us her early experience. Um, and also uh, want to remind the attendees to keep an eye out for webinar email. 
and uh, that uh, remind the attendees that the seminar has been recorded and is available, will be available shortly on the WAPA website uh, uh, for uh, further review and any, any family members that missed out, they can catch up on it at that stage. And with, with that, I'd like to say thank you again to all and to conclude uh, this webinar. Thank you very thank much, you. everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.